Welcome back. In this section, we're talking about training Spark in the cloud. Previously, we talked about connecting our local Spark to Google Cloud Storage. And in this video, we want to talk about creating a local Spark cluster, even though we are talking about training Spark in the cloud. But before we can do this, I want to talk about two things. So first, we need to see how to turn the Jupyter Notebook into a script. And then second, how we can use Spark Submit for submitting Spark jobs. So for that, we first will use a local cluster. So we will see how to do this in this video and we will see other things I mentioned. And then in the next video, we will actually see how to run this completely in the cloud. So even though I'm running this in a virtual machine, I still consider this as local air quotes environment because this is technically almost the same as you would run this on your laptop. So for that, let me open this Spark SQL. So before we were doing this local star and uh, when we run this, when we run, when we execute this cell, what happens under the hood is we create a local Spark cluster and then we connect to this local Spark cluster. And we connect to this using this URL, local force 4040. So this is our Spark master. And this Spark master was created because we created a Spark session where we said that master is local and then Spark set this up. So I will shut down the kernel. So now this thing should be gone. I guess it's not shut down immediately. Okay, now it's gone because I we actually had two of them. So yeah, you see, we cannot connect to this because we stopped the notebook, that we stopped the kernel that created this. And now I want to create a cluster, a Spark cluster, outside of the notebook. For that, I will follow this document. So I just found this in Google when I looked up Brian Spark in standalone mode. And yeah, we need to... It's as simple as running this thing. So now I will open this in my terminal. I will go to my Spark directory right? and then Spark. So this is my Spark home, I think. Home. Yeah, so this is where I install Spark. And I just need to go to this directory and execute this thing. And then it actually starts Spark Master. So it has started this. And now if I attempt to go there, I think we need to run it on port 8080. So let me open another port. So port 8080. Okay, yeah, so I think when we start the Spark Master using this tool, so instead of 4040, it creates it on port 8080. This is the Spark Master, and we have some information about the master. And now in our notebook, we instead of using local, we can just say a master is local. I think we need to write it like that. Spark. Oh, we can see it here, right? So this is the URL. But instead of this long URL, we just need to write localhost. And then this is how we start it. This is how we connect. I think I need to restart it. So now it's trying to connect to this Spark master. Yeah, I, I think it cannot connect. Maybe I'll try a different way of connecting. For some reasons it cannot connect. I think the problem is because it uses this URL and I don't know if I try this without changing it to localhost, if it will work. Let me restart it. Yeah, actually it seems to be able to connect to this. Okay, good. Yeah, I didn't know that uh, this thing actually resolves to the URL. If you don't run this on a virtual machine, maybe you will have a slightly different result. But at least on the virtual machine, this is how you need to do this. And you see, we need to specify the master and then we connect it to master here. So we see the application ID here and we can click on this and see what's happening. And now let's run something. Now it actually goes through the files and sees what are the files are there. Before it can create a data frame, it needs to know what are the files there and how to put all of them together in a data frame. And you see, we have this thing. Initial job has not accepted any resources. Check your cluster URL to ensure that workers are registered. So the thing here is we started a cluster, but we have zero workers. We only have a master. We need actually something to take care of executing the thing. So we need a, an executor. And when we go back to this page, it says what we need to do to start the worker. So let me go back here and I will start the worker. I think we need to master Spark URL. Let me try to copy this one. I don't know if this is the right one. Uh, we use a slightly older version of Spark. So it was called instead of worker, it was called slave. So we need to use that instead of worker. And now we were able to connect to this. And if I refresh, we have a worker here and we have a task and we see that the state is running. 
So it was executed because Spark saw that there is an executor and it just used the executor to execute this thing. And I think now we can just mm, execute the entire thing here. I want to print these columns because I think this could be useful later when we convert this to a script. So instead of running this code, I just want to explicitly specify what are the common columns. Okay, and then so let me just execute this and see if everything works. Now it seems that it works. I will just edit this slightly. So we will register table and we will execute this code. Right. I forgot to run this. Yeah, this works. Well, I didn't execute this thing, so because the next thing I want to do is now I want to turn this notebook into a Python script. For that, I will go to my terminal. And I want to turn this thing now into a Python script. So I will do Jupyter and be convert. I think we did this once already. It's to script. And then we just specify what notebook we want to convert to a script. So we converted it. I can close it now. And I will open now this in um, Visual Studio Code. And this is the file. Yeah, it looks strange. I don't know why Jupyter Notebook is uh, NB Convert is doing that. I think I was too fast to close it. So let me just copy it like that. And yeah, it somehow loses formatting here. So. And I will move this at the top don't need this and this should look nice this should also look nice now we do union all register a temporary table and execute this sql query and then we write results back to this location so what i will do now is i will just go to my terminal and execute this so i will just use python to execute this thing i forgot to add this so what it will do now it will connect to spark master that we set up separately and it will do everything right now it is executing this thing here yeah it seems you see we still have uh, this thing here right so it says initial job has not accepted any resources i think the problem for that is we probably have two applications. So the first application is our notebook, which took all the resources. So we didn't specify how many executors we need. So it took everything that was available, all four cores. And the thing that we run right now, it cannot get any resources. So we need to remove the first application. And now, yeah, so this thing, it's not connected to master. So this thing now is being executed. Yeah, actually, you see it finished and it disconnected. Now, if we go to data report, we can see that it was created today. There are a few things we can improve here. But right now, this thing, we hard code the input data. So we say that you always read from this folder. And for yellow, you always read from this folder. But what if we want to run this job just for one month or for a year? for 2020, not for the entire app history. So we want to make it configurable. And the easiest way to do this configurable is to use uh, CLI, command line interface. This is very similar to what we did previously in uh, week one. So this in just data script, maybe you remember, we used arc parse package. So we will use also this arc parse package here to make this script configurable. To make this script configurable, we use something like this. So let me paste it here. This is actually optional, we don't need that. So let's see what we have. We have multiple arguments. The first argument would be input green. I'll remove help. Then input yellow. And then output. So we have three arguments. And this is our input folder. So input green. After parsing, it will go to input green. All right. So this will go here. Then we'll have input yellow. So this will be input yellow it goes here and finally we have output so this will be our output so this is how we configure this script and we have more flexibility we can say where it should read from where it should write to from the command line interface i will do something like this right now so i will first type it in vs code and then i will paste it to terminal and execute it so we execute this thing and then we have multiple arguments. So it's input green and then we'll have input yellow. 
and we have output. Let's just do it for one year, for 2020. Uh, so this will be data, yellow, 2020, then star, that's actually green. And we need to, to have this PQ parquet. Then for yellow, we have yellow, and output will be, let's say, data, report, 2020. So let's execute that. Now it should write to this separate directory. Probably we should add more login because right now when we look at this, we have no idea what's going on. It's ex executing something. Hopefully it's doing something we expect it to do, meaning that it will calculate revenue for 2020. Okay. It was fast. Uh, remember for 2020, we didn't have much data. And if I check now, data report 2000. Yeah, we have this one file right, with the report. So this is how we make it configurable. But imagine we have multiple clusters. Every time specifying this master here is not convenient because, for example, we have one cluster that we run locally, but when we run this thing on Airflow, we need to use some different uh, something else, a different URL. So hard coding this thing, the master here, is not very practical. And there are other things that we might want to specify here, like how many executors we want to have, so things like this, which we didn't cover in this course yet, but in practice, usually you say that I want to have 10 executors that have one gigabyte of RAM each. What usually happens is we don't specify this configuration here in the Python script, but we specify it outside and we use a tool called Spark Submit for doing this. And I will show you how to do this right now. So we will remove master from here. So here we will just use Spark section, builder and so on. So we do not specify master here, but we specify master outside and we use a thing called Spark Submit. So first let me uh, write this to a URL and then yeah, we use Spark Submit spark submit like that this is a script that comes with spark that we can use for submitting spark jobs to spark clusters let me quickly google it so there is some syntax that we can use yeah so you see this spark submit then we specify some things like class this is important if we run in scala or java so i think in this example this is more like a java scala example in case of PySpark, do we have an example mm -hmm. here yeah, I don't see an example here, but instead of examples.jar or specifying a class, we just specify the Python file we want to execute. So in our case, the Python file is this. And yeah, even before that, we need to specify a master. So for us, master will be this URL. And then some other configuration if needed, like all these things. So this executor memory, how many cores we want to have, and so on. Yeah, we don't do this. We just specify the master here and then the file we want to execute. And then we need to specify these things. So we just copy them and put them after. So here, before the Python file, we specify the configuration for the task we submit to the master. And after the Python file, we configure the job itself. Let me execute this for 2020. Now we will use this for submitting it to a Spark cluster that is running locally. I think I forgot something, right? Yeah, I had an extra space here. Okay, now it's working. We see a lot more content here because we use Spark Submit for submitting this. But in practice, this is the way you submit Spark jobs to a Spark cluster. So you're using Spark Submit and you do not hard code the Spark Master URL and other configuration in your Python script. So you do it through Spark Submit. Yeah, you see it is outputting some stuff here, but I think it finished. So did we do this for 2021? Yes, and if I go to data report, we have for 2020 that we run without Spark Submit and 2021 that we run with Spark Submit. This is all I wanted to cover in this lesson. So in this lesson, I wanted to show you how we can turn our notebook in a Python file. We did that. Then I showed you how we can create a standalone Spark cluster. We did that as well. So we created a Spark master and then we created an executor and we connected this executor to the master. And then I showed you how to use Spark submit for submitting Spark jobs. And I think also I showed you how you can configure these Spark scripts to make it more flexible and run the same job for different arguments and when you use this for let's say airflow this is pretty useful because this is how you configure your spark jobs to run for different months or days and so on okay so i think that's all for this video 
and in the next video i will show you how you can create a spark cluster in google cloud platform so you will not need to run spark in standalone mode on your virtual machine or on your local laptop you can just create a cluster in google cloud platform so one thing i forgot to mention is you need to stop the workers and stop the master after you finish for that you just use this script again uh, as bin folder and then stop for older version it's stop slave for newer version it's stop worker and then stop uh, master so now nothing is running and if we try to connect yeah, nothing is there so it's stopped so this is how you stop them after you're done with your work